We're back for our third Coffee Lake component review, this time analyzing the unlocked i3-8350K CPU. When the i3-7350K came out, we noted that it made absolutely no sense at its launch price, but that we really encouraged the direction of overclockable i3 CPUs and hoped Intel would continue that just with more sensible pricing. It was a mix of good idea, bad price, and price ultimately dictates viability in the market. Today we're back to see if the 8350K suggested retail price of $168 to $179 makes any sense and if the CPU can even be had at those prices. Before getting to that, this coverage is brought to you by EVGA and NVIDIA with the Destiny 2 1080Ti bundle. The 1080Ti SC2 comes with asynchronous fan control for its dual fans, nine thermal sensors, and again includes Destiny 2. Learn more at the link in the description below. With the shakeup from Coffee Lake just going through the data before this video was almost a little confusing. At times, I'd be looking at an i5-8400 versus an 8350K, and kind of wondering why the performance was the way it was. And the thing is, you have to remember that Intel now has moved to six cores, six threads for the i5-8400 and upward, and that impacts things significantly. Obviously games and software that uses the extra two cores will seriously benefit from it. And that means that the stepping between an i3 and an i5 in some applications is now greater than previously. What's also different, of course, is that with an unlocked i3 CPU, like the 7350K, we have some headroom to gain that back. The question, as it was with KB Lake, is whether or not it actually makes sense to buy one and overclock it to try and claw your way up to an i5 that's locked, or if you should just buy the locked i5 to begin with and call it a day there. And at this price, it's pretty damn close to locked i5 territory anyway. So the i5-8400, depending on where you check and when you check, if you can find it, seems to be in the range of 180 to maybe $200. Sometimes it goes higher if it's sold by third parties, but that seems to be about the range for retailers. The 8350K is supposed to be a little bit cheaper than the 8400 i5 CPU, which is six core, six thread, as opposed to the 8350K's four core, four thread setup. But uh, it doesn't seem to be available for that price right now. So. Uh, when they appear, they're roughly the same price, plus or minus $10, that makes them direct competitors. So the R5-1600, for example, makes more sense to compare to the 8350K because ultimately they fall at about the same price, ignoring the cost of things like the motherboard and just looking at strictly the CPUs. So for the purpose of this video, we're primarily gonna focus the verbal energy on talking about the R5 versus the 8350K. There are some R3 benchmarks in here, Keep in mind that this is new test methodology for us that we introduced with Coffee Lake, so not everything has been retested yet, including some of the R3 SKUs. However, the R3 SKUs are significantly cheaper, target a slightly different market, and therefore don't necessarily need to be here as much as the R5s, which are here. Quickly for overclocking, as always, we have all the components used in the article linked in the description below, so click the article for the full testing methods and things like that. But for overclocking, we use the Ultra Gaming Z378 Gigabyte board. It is not my favorite board to overclock with, but it gets the job done. And we were able to do 4.8 gigahertz at 1.375 for the V core with an AVX offset of two. So we're going negative two on the multiplier for AVX applications like Blender, which means it will run at 4.6 rather than 4.8, whereas everything else runs at 4.8. That helps stabilize things. We did push voltage as high as 1.42, and we're not able to stabilize beyond 4.8 gigahertz for non-AVX applications. So sadly, no 4.9, no 5.0. It might be achievable with a different motherboard, but we didn't get it with this one for this CPU. So a bit limited there. Uh, some of this also may come down to load line calibration and things like that, but we're still playing around with it. Civilization 6 will start us off on the gaming benchmark side. This one is a frequency intensive benchmark and has proven that turn time is less dependent on cores. Note also that the Civ AI benchmark should not be used to test FPS because worse CPUs will score higher frame rates as a result of spending more time on static screens. A G4560, for instance, would outperform an R7-1700 or I7-7700K. That's not because it's better, it's because of how the benchmark is built. Somewhat surprisingly, the i3-8350K performs about where the R5-1600X at 4.1 gigahertz performs. This shows the frequency importance for the title. The 8350K completes each turn in 18 seconds, totaling 90 seconds for all five turns. 
The R5 1600X finishes in 17.9 seconds at 4.1 GHz or 19.2 seconds stock. The Intel i5-8400, meanwhile, completes turns in roughly 17.5 seconds, depending on the memory frequency for the CPU. Overclocking the 8350K to 4.8 GHz reduces the time requirement by 9.6%, tying the CPU with a stock 8700K. GTA 5 at 1080p with custom settings plots our i3-8350K at 123 FPS average, marking it about on par with the i5-7600K stock CPU and i5-8400 stock CPU. The i3-8350K runs about 13% faster than our fastest Ryzen CPU on this bench, the overclocked 1700, and about 4.5% faster than the i5-8400 with 2666 MHz memory. Scaling upward, the stock 7700K leads the 8350K stock by 6.7%, with the overclocked 8350K outperforming the stock 7700K by about 3.6%. This leapfrogs upward, with the overclocked 7700K CPU eventually winning out, and the 8700K predictably leading the chart. From top to bottom, the 8700K stock CPU leads the 8350K stock CPU by 18.1%. As for the R3 CPUs, the R3-1300X at $130 operates at 86 FPS average, putting it predictably behind the R5-1500X, 1600X, and R7-1700. At 1440p, the gap closes as we encounter GPU limitations. The overclocked 8700K now encounters a GPU bottleneck, falling to 131 FPS average and establishing our new ceiling. The 8350K still lines up in the same spot in the stack, keeping its positioning right around the stock 7600K or OC performance at between the 7700K and 5 GHz 7700K. Total War Warhammer at 1080p high lands the stock 8350K at 145 FPS average, right between the stock 7600K and overclocked R5 1600X at 4.1 GHz. The 8400 performs about 3.3% ahead of the stock 8350K when the 8400 runs slower memory, or 7.3% ahead when it uses the same memory speed. Overclocking the 8350K to 4.8 GHz puts it about on par with the 8400 using 3200 MHz of memory, and behind the stock 7700K with its eight threads. The top to bottom difference between the 8700K and 8350K is about 22% leadership for the i7. At 1440p, the 8350K stock CPU operates at 128 FPS average, planting it ahead of the overclocked R7-1700 and about tied with the R5-1600X. Frame time performance at the low end is also roughly equal, and we are again tied with the 7600K. The 8400 carries a strong lead with both memory configurations over the i3, but loses that lead once we overclock the 8350K to 4.8 GHz. Watch Dogs 2 tends to actually like threads, unlike most games on the market. This game positions the overclocked i3 at 84 FPS average with lows at 68 FPS 1% and 56 FPS 0.1% lows. The stock 1600X is roughly tied with the overclocked 8350K, carrying a lead of 2.7% when both are overclocked. As for the stock 8350K, that's left behind with the 7600K stock CPU, demonstrating the core and thread advantage in Watch Dogs 2. 1440p keeps mostly the same scaling within test variance and error, and shows that the 8350K remains about tied with the previous 7600K, outputting roughly the same results as previously within error. Ashes of the Singularity is our final game, and also one that is thread limited. Ashes plots the 8350K at the very bottom of the list, roughly tied with the 7600K. This makes for an unimpressive display by the i3. The R5-1600X stock CPU is 22% ahead of the stock 8350K CPU, a difference which squarely lands on the thread advantage. The i3-8350K just doesn't keep up very well in this test. Moving on to power, as a reminder, our power testing is done at the EPS 12 volt cables rather than the wall, so these numbers are more or less the CPU power consumption numbers as measured entering into the board. The stock i3-8350K consumes about 47 watts when rendering our Blender scene, putting it within error margins of the overclocked R3-1200 CPU at 3.9 GHz and a couple watts away from the 1300X stock CPU. This also plants the 8350K right around where the previous 7350K was at 5 GHz, but note that the difference in motherboards means we're not taking VRM losses into account. Overclocking the 8350K to 4.8 GHz, though using an AVX offset of 2 for Blender, 
we land at 84 watts with our 1.375 volt core and that puts us near the stock 1600X, not too distant from the 96 watt of the stock 8700K. 3D Mark's Fire Strike measures the 8350K at 34 watts, or a 27% higher power consumption than where we measured the R3 1200 with the R3 1300X at 11% higher than the stock 8350K. Overclocking the Coffee Lake i3 to 4.8 gigahertz at 1.375 volts, puts us up to 1600X stock levels of power consumption and not far from the 8700K stock CPU. Using Total War Warhammer as a gaming workload, for which we haven't yet added the R3 CPUs, the i3-8350K consumes about 34 watts stock or 71.3 when overclocked. Respectively, that puts us either below everything or between the AMD R5-1600X stock and i7-7700K at 1.39 V-Core, depending on if you're looking at the i3 overclocked or not. Prime 95 29.2 with 8K FFTs provides taxing AVX workloads, creating a range of 38 watts to 590 watts depending on the voltage of the CPU and which CPU. The i3-8350K predictably falls closer to the low end at 65 watts stock, which lands it as nearby the overclocked R3 CPUs and below the i5-8400 or stock R5 CPUs. Overclocking demands 111 watts, keeping the stack the same as we saw earlier. Our Blender renders now use three different scenes, two of which were created in-house and one of which was modified for use. Starting with the two main ones, our monkey head scene on Blender 2.79, the $170 to $200 i3 Coffee Lake CPU completes this scene dead last at 58 minutes to render the frame. The R5-1500X stock CPU priced at $170 finishes with a 13% time reduction over the Coffee Lake chip though overclocking the i3 to 4.6 gigahertz mostly catches it up. That said, we've never really recommended the 1500X anyway, and would rather point you toward the 1600 or 1600X for a budget rendering CPU. The extra threads matter. The 1600X stock CPU completes the task in 33 minutes, a 43% time requirement reduction. The price isn't too dissimilar from a 1600 and 8350K, and overclocking a 1600 matches it to a 1600X anyway. Clearly, if budget rendering is important to you, the R5s win easily. Just decide whether rendering performance is more important than gaming, and then maybe consider the i5s as well, look at the price, and make a decision from there. As for the other scenes, the GN logo render puts the 8350K at 71 minutes stock, or 62 minutes when overclocked. The R5-1600X completes this test in about 35 to 38 minutes, so no contest there. Time Spy is next. We have the i3-8350K stock CPU scoring 4241 points on this CPU test, translating to 14.25 FPS for the physics benchmark. This outperforms the 7350K notably and performs below the 1500X by 6.5%. Overclocking the 8350K gets it to a deficit of 9.9% against the locked 8400, which has an additional two cores that significantly help. This chart alone makes it a hard sell for the 8350K as the i5-8400 functionally costs the same and cost is lower if you're looking at this in the future anyway when the non-Z boards theoretically actually exist. Some games make it kind of hard to defend the 8350K over even Intel's own i5-8400. Depending on when you look at the prices, they're roughly the same, close enough to choose one or the over the other depending on the performance. And the 8400 in games that care about the extra threads and applications like Time Spy, like Blender, it matters. Those extra two threads matter a whole lot more than the unlocked factor of the i3, which, depending on how good your chip is and how much you're willing to push the VRM temperatures and things like that, it's not a guarantee how high that clock goes. So it is a bit of a gamble. It's fun to overclock, of course. We strongly encourage that these companies like AMD with the all of the Ryzen chips and Intel with their now Case-Q i3s, we encourage that they continue permitting overclocking on the low end. It throws a wrench in the segmentation a bit, but it makes for a better product overall. Uh, it doesn't, however, count for the fact that if the product sells at a much higher price because it's unlocked, it now eats into the territory of its own brethren, the i5 in this case, the 8400 non-K CPU. So depending on the game, depending on the application, the 8400 can be a better buy, particularly when the extra two threads really matter. What it comes down to is, are you only gaming with your system, by which I mean your other tasks consist primarily of things like web browsing, Microsoft Office products, maybe Photoshop, things like that in a, a non-extreme Photoshop user fashion. 
then maybe uh, it's worth looking at one of the non-production focused CPUs. If you are doing any meaningful amount of rendering, whether that's with Blender, Premiere, or otherwise, it is worth considering either an R5, the 1600 and 1600X, we've strongly recommended since they came out. Those, where they lose in gaming, they make up for in production. So if your scale of usage teeters more toward production, it's probably worth buying the R5 CPU if you can't afford something higher end. If your scale teeters more towards gaming, it's still worth absolutely looking at the Intel CPUs, but look through the games that you play the most and kind of mentally put together when the i5 makes more sense than the i3. In a lot of instances, they're either close enough that it's irrelevant or the i5-8400 just kind of works better with the games that actually care about the threads, like, like Watch Dogs 2. And the overclocking, depending on how serious you are about it, may or may not be worthwhile for you. Uh, it's nice that it's present and it's certainly fun to use, but you do lose enough off the CPU that it starts falling behind in some applications, even with the OC. So that's all for this one. As always, you can check the article linked below for everything. There might be a couple of extra charts there that we don't have here. Uh, a quick note on pricing and availability at the time of filming this, there were none available. So that's very unfortunate. And it's been that way since Coffee Lake launched. So definitely disappointing to see that again. Theoretically, this is a mature process. Theoretically, Intel should be able to start pumping them out en masse, but we'll see whether they actually do. As of now, it's pretty hard to get. Uh, if you've been waiting for a Coffee Lake CPU, any of them, the word we've received is that they generally restock at major, at least US retailers, about every other week, once per week. So if you don't see it, check every week, and hopefully you'll see one pop up. But that's all for now. As always, subscribe for more. You can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. Store.gamersnexus.net to pick up a shirt like this one. And I think we now have decals, as in stickers, on the store. I haven't even gotten mine yet. So if you want to beat me to it, they're over there. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.